Our next speaker is uh, also a member of the ISO C++ committee. And he is part of the Austrian delegation in the ISO C++ and he also works for RISC uh, software. And he is going uh, to go deep in one of my favorite topics, <laughs> which is type erasure. You know, a uh, uh, sentence, some kind of thing, like last year talked about concepts. That was one of your favorite things. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> we seem to be on the same page most of the time. Apparently, yeah. Not always, but most of the time. So, Michael, thank you very much uh, for coming. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, one thing, uh, I'm not associated with the architecture, so this is <laughs> because the question comes up every time. And it's also not about risk management, it's the name of the institute we were spun off, it's research and symbolic computing. Uh, I won't go into the details what we're working on because there are so many projects and I can't even think about all of them. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about type erasure and uh, just to get a feel for the room, how many of you have implemented something with type erasure in C++? That's about, well, 40%. Okay, let's see if there's anything new I can tell you, but let's have a good time. <laughs> so let's start with a simple question. Uh, how do I write an algorithm that takes a, functional, a stateful function object? And I'm doing a lot of teaching next to my work, so one of the answers I get is we can do it with object orientation, so we can define a abstract base class. And I'm violating misread there apparently because I don't have a virtual distractor, but let's just ignore it for the day. And then I have a function that takes the interface by reference or by pointer that depends on your use case. And later on, I have an implementation that implements my interface and overrides the abstract parts, and I can then call the function. And from the looks of it, that's pretty nice because I have separate compilation. Um, that's unfortunately where the fun part ends because that's really intrusive and it forces me into a type hierarchy. And if you are controlling the class that's actually going to be passed in, that's kind of okay. But reality is you have to interact with classes you cannot change and then it gets really ugly with adapters and so on. And another thing is this implies reference semantics. So I have no way to internally uh, copy this thing. I can use something like a smart pointer, but in general, with object orientation, I can't really do anything in, apart from using reference semantics here. Which means inside my XYZ function, I have actually no idea to figure out, am I the only one who's actually accessing the object at the moment? Which is kind of important if you think about it. So, okay, we can do it with object orientation, but it may not be what we want to do all the time. So is there something different we can do? Well, we can do it with te templates and concepts. And I can say I have a concept that models how my argument type must uh, implement. And later on, I have a function. And as we already heard today, that's actually a template. And later on, I can use that function with anything that models the concept. Um, that's really nice because that's non intrusive. Uh, because concepts are matched implicitly. That's also cool because that has value semantics. So inside XYZ, I'm the only owner of that thing. One really bad thing though is it has to be a template. And for small functions, that's actually okay. But if we think about bigger logical blocks that may not be what you want because you then have to have them in the header and reinstantiate them for every possible thing. So the question this talk is gonna focus on is can we get all of the good things without all the negatives? And we'll find out. So let's go back to the basics. And this is the one part where I think Daniel may want to call me out on, because I'm going to claim the first time this comes up with uh, the topic of type ratio was by Kathleen Henney in 2000. <laughs> Any objection? <laughs> okay. 
Okay, and the paper that's uh, named value conversion, it is a nice read. There's this class called any. And the name is pretty much what it does. It can store any type. And it, we'll look at how it does that in a moment, but the interface is kind of weird. Like the thing you can do with that is you can construct it from any value you want. And there's this function called anycast where you can specify, okay, this is, it's a template, so that's the type I want to get. And if the any stores exactly the type you want to request, you get a reference to that thingy. Otherwise, you get an exception. <laughs> and there are other things, but essentially, usage of any boils down to this thing. Um, it's implemented kind of like this. So you have this class that's importantly, not a template in itself, that holds a pointer to some class placeholder, and the constructor of any is actually a template. And therein happens the real magic where we instantiate some template called holder in the original paper with the type we know, and store it in the type erased pointer called content. So that's the basic idea that's described in this paper, how you do type erasure. So from a modern point of view the, on the right, this is how it will probably look like in your implementation. Um, from a modern point of view, any is kind of interesting because it's a value tab, that's nice. It has a non-virtual interface, so all the virtual stuff is inside the class hidden from you and you don't have to deal with it. The negative thing is uh, the name is actually a lie. A better name would be any copyable, though that's a horrible name. <laughs> and I can't think of a good name for this thing. And it turns out we regularly get this notion of move-only types in C++ now, since we have move semantics. And this internally uses inheritance, which may not be a problem for you, but is a problem for people who care about heap allocations. And it uses RTTI. And I don't think there's any standards compliant way to do it any other way. You can fake it if you assume some things about the types you put in there, but in the general case, you need to use something like RTDI here. So any, for the time when it was specified, was kind of groundbreaking, but the question is, can we do better in the general case? And I'm going to take a detour and talk about stateless numbers for a moment. So um, we've seen this one. Uh, I think in Hannah's talk. And I want to point out one thing here. How many of you have seen a plus inside of a, a stateless lambda before? That's about the same much as those who, of you who have done something with type erasure. Okay. So what's actually going to happen here is uh, we need to check what the compiler actually does because from the looks of it, the doesn't sound like something that should be possible. So the first thing we need to know is a lambda is actually transformed into some unspeakable type with an overloaded function call operator. And that's where the story pretty much ends apart from a constructor if you have a stateful lambda. But for a stateless lambda, we get like a whole lot of different stuff, including a function pointer type declaration with some internal name. So we can't actually access that name directly. And a conversion operator to that function pointer. And we get a static function that pretty much represents a different way to access the body of our lambda from before. So anybody want to venture? Oh, yeah. And the lambda is replaced by instantiating that new type. So, OK. Still don't see an overloaded operator plus, though. So, What's going on? Well, there's this rule that when the compiler has to figure out what you actually want to do, he can invoke one user-defined conversion operator. And that operator there is a user-defined conversion operator. So what essentially happens is uh, we get this nice line of code. So if we default construct our stateless lambda type, we can then convert it to a function pointer type. and a pl unary plus on a function pointer type is actually cool. That's a knob. That's a, that's a syntactically expensive way to specify a knob. So 
yeah, we can do that, so sure. So in other words, uh, if we prefix uh, stateless lambda with a, func uh, with a plus, we can get a function pointer. And now you may ask, what's going on? Why is he wasting so much time talking about stateless lambdas? Well, in the beginning of the talk, we left out one of the most important things, how to do polymorphism. The one we rarely talk about uh, because it's C and not C++ style, which is function pointers. So all, let's go back to the initial example. How can I do it? Well, there's the standard pattern that I think there's exactly two functions in the C standard library that use, which are B search and Q search, of saying, okay, I'll specify a function pointer type that's untyped, so the parameter types are void. And I'll pass in a second parameter of type void. And it's your responsibility to give me something where those two voids actually represent the same type afterwards. So you'd use that by, say we have a functor and you pass on the address of the object and some function that takes the untyped pointer and reconstructs the real type within. And Let's look at this for a moment. From the looks of it, okay, this enables separate compilation. Um, this is non-intrusive for obvious reasons, but this obviously has reference semantics because we're only dealing with pointers now. White pointers, like, we have no chance to get anything but reference semantics at this point. And this is not type safe, which is why you shouldn't actually do this in normal code. But it's interesting. Let's transform this example a little bit. So what I can say is if I functor, I can split it in two things. It's representation in memory. And if I don't care about the type information, that's pretty much a void pointer. And some behavior that represents how to actually call the overloaded function call operator. And as we've just seen, I can just use a function that takes a void pointer and reestablishes the type information before calling. Okay, let's transform this a little bit. Oh yeah, there's the axiom that's got a hold because we know from C that it's got a hold, whether I call the functor directly or via the indirection through behavior will yield the same logic. There may be something in terms of performance, but we don't care about this right now. So let's regroup this a bit. Let's say you have a struct and I store the representation and the behavior in there. Then I can have a function that takes that struct and <clears throat> I just have to initialize the struct correctly. So this is interesting. This is still not type safe because obviously you have to make sure that representation and behavior are matched, but we are not C. So in C++, I don't have to like allow you to do that externally. Instead, I can say, okay, that sounds like something that should be protected when invariant. So probably set up a constructor and then be private. And then I think we found something because if I have a struct, I can customize copyability. And then I can actually implement something like value semantics based upon this representation. So let's do this by an example. Let's implement a non owning function object reference. And how do we actually design this type of waste uh, wrappers? There are like three steps. Step one is we collect what's typically called our affordances. And we can think about of, as of affordances as every operation we want to be available after type erasure. And I think aspect is actually the better word because it turns out you can do more than just operations with this approach. Um, come to me after the talk sir, and I can show you some examples of what else you can actually do then. Um, so everything we want to provide later on is an affordance. Everything we don't 
decide to be in affordance will be deleted. And given that we have concepts, it may be a good idea to collect your affordances in a concept. So step two is, okay, let's decide how we actually want to represent our operations. And how do we implement our wrapper type based on those representations? And step three is we actually implement the type of reasoning logic, aka the constructor. And we're gonna do a little example. It's in function ref. So we have like three affordances. Our thing should be invocable with an int. It will not return anything and it may throw an exception. All of those three are part of uh, affordances. We could actually talk about more things like reference qualification, constants, but let's keep it simple, only these three. Um, so specified as a concept would look something like this. So we require that our thingy is invocable with an end and returns nothing. And in memory, it would look something like this. So we will have our struct with these two pointers. One of them points to the static memory where hopefully our function pointer resides. And the functor we don't actually know or care about where it lives. Could be in static memory, could be on the heap, could be in automatic memory on the stack. So that's our thing. So let's start implementing this. And here we have the basic design. So it's pretty much the thingy we had on a few slides before, just extended with the parameter. And as we can see, our function call operator is implemented in terms of our type based logic. The important thing is actually where our to do currently is. So let's start implementing the constructor and we've actually established how to do that. So let's take the address of whatever we have passed to and let's then set up a function pointer to do the correct thing. Uh, are we done? So, show of hands, who thinks we are done? One, two, okay, maybe two. Uh, maybe um, forwarding references or universal references are kind of weird. So, the thing called func type could be a reference type, so just to k that, there may be a, a nicer way to do that, but that suffices for this talk. Um, are we done yet? For functors, we probably are, but we probably also want to work this to work with function pointers. So let's add another constructor. We could do that with const expra, uh, if const expra, but it's nicer to do it with overloading. So we'll have a se second constructor that also matches the concept, but is a pointer. And just check that this is really a function we are pointing to and Except that it's not a null pointer we've got because we, we probably don't want a, a null pointer in there. And what we're going to do is we then cast it to a void pointer. And I think now Peter will tell me again that I'm violating Misria. <laughs> and at least two accounts. <laughs> because I'm point, uh, casting a, a function pointer type to a void pointer. And that's <laughs> all outside of the standard, lab, uh, standard anyway. But it turns out on every major implementation that's actually okay because dynamic loading uses that. In a real world implementation, it would be nicer to uh, use something like a union and, and don't cast your function pointer type to a void pointer. But the nice thing we see here is we have two different types of parameters we get and all of them are represented the same inside our type erased implementation. So. That looks nice, so let's evaluate this a little bit. Um, say we have a function that's implemented with this int function ref as a parameter type. And we have some function that matches our concept. And what we can actually do is we can now call our XYZ via a function reference or multiple different ways to get a function pointer or functors no matter whether they are stateful or not. So that's, we have separate compilation. It's non-intrusive. Still reference semantic though. We haven't talked about ownership. So let's talk about ownership for a moment. Um, what about ownership? 
And let's just go from an int function ref to an int function. So we can use the same affordances we already had and add a few new ones. Which ones do we need? Well, uh, probably copyability which essentially implies movability, distractability, maybe swappability. And to keep it a little bit simpler, let's do it like any and say, our object will always be on the heap. Because in that case, we only care about copyability and distractability. Moving and swapping for pointers that are point to the heap is trivial. So we just got a new few new affordances and our thingy will look something like this. So there are a few question marks there because as I alluded to, we have to decide on the type based representation. And now that we have more than one affordance, there are actually some things we may think about. Like we can do the obvious thing. Every affordance gets its dedicated function pointer. Um, that obviously works. And maybe in this case, it's not that big of a problem, but we just doubled the size of our type. And whether or not that's a problem on your platform or on your target system is totally on you. That's something you need to be aware of. So is there something else we could do? Um, well, we could merge some of those affordances into one function. And the easy thing you can do probably in every case is merging the lifecycle management functions. And the idea is we introduce a function with an additional argument that tells you at runtime what you're actually going to do. So if I pass in one, I'll get the distraction in this case. If I get pass in ah, zero, I get distraction in one, I get copy construction. If I pass in two, I uh, probably don't want to do that in this case. So the wrapper has to make sure that all calls are valid. Um, so we reduce the amount of memory. We use obviously now there's a little bit of runtime overhead, but as you will see, that's the nice thing with type erasure. We can actually decide which trade-offs we want to use. Uh, third thing is uh, the popular one where we say, let's do what the compiler does for object orientation collect all those functions point, function pointers in something like a vtable and make sure that thing lives in the static memory. And we can pretty much do that by having a struct with all the function pointers we want and initializing that with static const expert within the constructor. And then we'll have the minimal representation of two pointers. So, there's one thing though, uh, maybe we want to mix some of those approaches. Um, I'm mainly showing you that so you can see that one thing you can do if you mix those is introduce readability helper functions that's like this detour function. If you wonder why you would ever do that, uh, come to me after the talk. I've actually done it in one implementation for very good reasons. Okay, but let's Step back a little. I said all of our objects live on the heap. Does that actually make sense? Um, how big is an object? How big is a functor? And type sizes are kind of implementation defined. There are little guarantees. One thing we are guaranteed is that the size of character is one. And if we limit ourselves to 64-bit vendors and Linux, int is four bytes. And pointers are eight bytes, no matter whether they are function pointers or object pointers. Do you note though that that's not a guarantee in the standard. So if we extend it to a struct, um, an empty struct has the size of one because there can never be a type with size zero. And if our struct is not empty, it will be the size pretty much of the members and the plus or minus some padding and alignment issues. So let's think about it. If our int function stores a, a functor without state, what we actually did was allocate one byte on the heap and store the 8-bit address to that one byte locally. 
<laughs> that sounds kind of mad. <laughs> and what popular implementations do is uh, this thing called small buffer optimization. It's similar to the thing uh, string does with small string optimization. And the idea is, OK, I'm not going to store only a pointer to the object. I'm more or less storing a union of a fixed size buffer whose size depends on your domain. And some pointer, and based on the thing you get and some other properties like how expensive is moving, I can now decide do I allocate on the heap or do I allocate into this buffer? And there's one thing we need to know move is now no longer trivial. Move can be something, it's a new affordance where we need to customize what's going to happen. Um, I think it will look something like this, and we won't look at code because um, writing code that handles both of these cases is not hard but ugly. Essentially, uh, there are uh, two ways either you duplicate the logic for creating your V table, or you branch at compile time inside every affordance function. And neither of those fits on a slide, and I think you get the point without me showing you the code. So, type erasure on itself uh, is also used in a standard library on multiple occasions. For obvious reasons, there is no use in 98, because I'm going to claim it was invented in 2000, and nobody has called me out on that yet. <laughs> um, in 2011, so C11, we got two uses of type erasure. One of them is surprising for most people, and it's share pointer. Um, what you need to know is SharePoint that doesn't require you to have a virtual destructor. So you can say I have a SharePoint of a base class, initialize it with make shared of a derived type, and that will work. You can later on cast around the SharePoint type even to void. And on this traction of the last SharePoint, uh, it doesn't matter what type the SharePoint externally said it was it will call the right deleter. Um, the other thing is function. Um, function is similar to the int function we just talked about. What is a bit surprising is maybe the function signature because you pass in a function type. And what gets generated from your function type is pretty much this. So you get an overloaded function call operator with your return type and your argument types, and notice that thingy is const. That will become important later. So in 14, nothing changed. In 17, we got one new thing. It's any. And it's, from all I can uh, say, it's the same thing we just talked about in the beginning. So let's not waste any more time. In 20, we got one new thing. It's coroutine handle. And that's surprising because most people don't talk about coroutines because we don't have library support for coroutines. Or let's say minimal, just generate after all. <laughs> so, um, and most people, if they look at it, will think, yeah, I can put void into promise. And that's what she's talking about. No, there's something way more important going on. Um, a coroutine has, is stackless. So it's somewhere all the local uh, variables need to live, and that's called the coroutine frame. And that object has a type that we don't know anything about. And compared to lambdas, we can't even like say, OK, here's an alias to that name, because we can never express the type of this coroutine frame thing. Um, in 23, we got one new thing. It's move-only function. Move-only function is similar to std function but with two cha important changes. One, it doesn't depend on RTTI. Two, uh, the function signature, uh, the type signature you can uh, specify is way longer. So you can specify option, uh, constness, no acceptness, referenceness, and all those are forwarded to the generated function call operator. Okay, and what looks like for 26 is we will get three new types. 
One of them is copyable function. And copyable function is essentially move only function, but our object will be copyable again. There's function ref, which is a non owning reference to something that matches the signature. And there's polymorphic. So polymorphic is important. I will have a few slides on it later on. Uh, but there's something strange going on there. Like, why do we have four function wrappers? And why are the new three ones are kind of consistent with, with each other, but the old one isn't? And why do we have a thingy called copyable function? If we already had a copyable function ref, a wrapper called function, well, remember the const? That's the thing. So all those additional things you can specify in a move-only function are something you probably also want to specify on a copyable function type. But introducing that into function is a breaking change. Like you break the whole world. So we can't do that. And there's another thing you should know uh, why you probably don't want to use function anymore. So. Let's go through this step by step. Um, if I have a lambda and a call, I can obviously call the lambda. If I have a const reference to my lambda type, I can also call that. Because lambdas are the one thing in C++ where we have a same default that everything is const. Um, if you have a step function, I can initialize that with my lambda. I can then create the const reference to my function object, and I can obviously call that thing. Everything's fine, nothing surprising. So to the fun part, you can write mutable onto a lambda, and that pretty much removes the const uh, from the function call operator that's generated. And if you create a const reference to that lambda, you can obviously not call it because you can't call a mutable function through a const reference. This has been a thing since C++ was created. <laughs> so I can create a function with my lambda. I can then call that function. Everything's fine. But if I create a const reference to this function, I can all of a sudden ignore that my lambda wasn't const and call the, through the const reference something that is mutable. And I'm gonna quote Daniel, we make mistakes, this is one, and we can't really fix it. Like, my recommendation is, once you have C++26, use copyable function and pretend that function doesn't exist anymore. So, uh, I have written that paper. It was talked about in Tokyo. People told me no. Well, what they said is maybe some point in the future, definitely not for 26, and we can debate that, I think, for the rest of the week, whether that's the right decision, but that was the decision we took. Peter? Don't to that paper for 29. I have it in my <laughs> calendar already. <laughs> So let's talk about polymorphic because I'm probably running out of time at this point. So what is polymorphic? Um, polymorphic is a polymorphic value type. It's pretty much a wrapper for something polymorphic that you don't want to use in the old style of pointers, but like with value semantics. And let's go use the example that everyone who has ever heard something about object orientation knows. We have this abstract base class called shape. And we have some implementations. Maybe we should also need a triangle, but these two will suffice. And with polymorphic, it's able to say, okay, I have a vector of polymorphic of shape, and I can construct it from an ellipse, a rectangle, or anything else that's matching polymorphic. And obviously, uh, if I iterate over the vector, I get the calls to the right draw. Otherwise, it hopefully wouldn't compile because the original draw is abstract. Uh, but the interesting thing is, if I take a copy of that vector, I get deep copies of all elements in the vector. And 
if I clear my vector or destroy the polymorphics in any other way, the correct destructors are called. Note, uh, I have no virtual destructor and I have no clone method, nothing. And polymorphic essentially does that with type erasure. So it has two affordances. My thingy must be copyable. And my thingy must be redirected from the original type T. And if that's given, then I can pretty much store anything that's derived from T and get value semantics. So we can imagine it to look something like this, though in the real world, we probably have another vtable point at this point that points to the compiler generated vtable. But I think you get the gist. Um, and with that to recap, um, type erasure allows us full flexibility because there are no predetermined design trade-offs. And we don't have to use RTTI or inheritance unless we want to. Um, we have separate compilation. It's non-intrusive. It's horrible code. <laughs> like, oh yeah, we have value semantics and then it's horrible code. Uh, uh, I'm going to quote Eric Niebler from almost four years ago of how it would be nice to have language support for this. And Daniel told me yesterday that he is a student working on that and I'm really looking forward to the results of that. Sure. Yeah, I've talked with him a few minutes ago. So with that, I'm done and open for questions. Questions? Can you go back to the slide where you do the stateful uh, the union with the bytes and the pointer? Uh, wait, so back before the standard library. Yeah. yeah what's the correct way of uh, like placing the, uh, the object in the buffer regardless regarding alignment? What is the, like the correct way of doing that? Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, we have something called max alignment, and I think the recommended way would be to say this buffer must be max aligned. I'm going to cheat here a little bit and say it doesn't matter for my platforms because they don't care about alignment. <laughs> but you, yeah, you need to have this correctly aligned for obvious reasons. You, you probably can use STD aligned storage. I think we deprecated that one. Oh, yeah. Is it I think it's deprecated. Something along those lines was deprecated. That I remember. I can't remember all the details. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's true. Thank you. When are we getting uh, move only polymorphic? <laughs> So, I mean, wrong direction. Um, you know, I'm going to say write a paper. On the other hand, I'm the one co responsible for copyable function. And it's funny because before it was added to the draft, people were like, that's a good idea. And other words, Afterwards, the social media exploded with, they totally lost their mind. <laughs> so I'm not going to write their papers. <laughs> I think uh, the original authors won't do it because they think about regular types and they are probably not that interested in a move only polymorphic. More questions? Uh, there was a proposal floating around the committee that didn't go uh, anywhere having to do with a thing called virtual concepts or runtime concepts by which you, you are familiar with the idea. Uh, yeah, I can't remember the details. It's been yeah, a few well, years, the, the idea so. basically was that uh, you are basically defining the interface of a type via requires and the language could potentially be able to generate a wrapper, a type erasure wrapper uh, presenting the exact same interface, et cetera. This is not gonna go anywhere in, with uh, standard, but I would like to know your opinions about these kind of approaches towards uh, type erasure of 
richer interfaces. So if we get something that automatically generates type erased wrappers, I hope the language to specify those interfaces will be something like concepts or ideally exactly concepts. Because concepts allow you to express things we can't in the language otherwise, like saying we have alternative signatures that we want to merge into one of photons. Like I have this demo uh, uh, written for university where we have this homework where you design an object-oriented chess game. And I thought that's way too complicated, that's way easier if you have value semantics and implemented it with type erasure. And there's the thing where you can have multiple signatures for an operation and those can be merged to one for your user. So. I hope we get something like this. I can't say anything about a potential timeline. During lunchtime, talk to him. <laughs> oh yeah, talk to him. It's pretty Don't much the syntax. He, <laughs> he is prototyping this language feature right now. I think back there was another question. Uh, ah, sorry. Thank you for the talk. Uh, would it make sense to have uh, short buffer optimization inside polymorphic? So, I uh, think I've drawn it correctly. So, so, notice the question mark. If I remember correctly, the paper doesn't outright forbid using SBO. Let's have to look at it again. I think it says we encourage implementers to implement it. But yeah, well, you can't require implementers to use SPO. Yeah. You can only say it may be implemented with SPO. And there is quality of implementation. Any other question? So. Huh? Oh, sorry. I didn't see you. Yeah, thanks. Just a very small question. Yeah. So all of those methods that was listed in the future C plus plus twenty six, are they like the same or like are they different ways to do the same thing? Like all of these methods now. Like uh, to use these type erasure in C plus plus, do you have to just like pick one of these methods and use it or uh, uh, I'm not really uh, getting what you're asking, sorry. Can we rephrase it a little bit? Okay. So these are like methods to implement type erasure in C++. Yeah. So I'm saying, are they different ways to do the same thing or they have to be used in hand in hand? You want to answer? Uh, uh, you give it a try. No. <laughs> I mean, a copyable function and function ref uh, and more formally function, they are just different wrappers with different properties. So it depends what you want, you will make your choice which one you want to use. Is that right? Yeah, and I uh, can give you a, a little uh, recommendation. If you don't need ownership over a thing, it's pretty obvious you want function ref as your input parameter, similar like you take a span or something. If you want ownership, uh, do you actually need copyability? If you don't need copyability, use move only function. This is probably the thing you really want to use most of the time. And otherwise, use copyable function. It's a pretty easy choice then. Okay. More questions? Okay, thank you very much, Michael.